Okay, our next speaker is Dr. John Schoonover. He's a forestry professor at Southern Illinois University, and he specializes in physical hydrology and soils. Over the past 18 years, his research has focused on developing agricultural BMPs to help farmers develop tools to combat erosion and water quality concerns. He also teaches courses in watershed management, soils, and forest products. Dr. Schoonover. I've been scratching my head ever since uh, Rita mentioned 2 o'clock is the time everybody's supposed to go to sleep. So I don't know if that means you're going to sleep through this one or I'm supposed to have the energy level that Dr. Bilo had. I don't, I don't think there's enough Red Bulls in the building to get that done. So uh, I'm going to talk about sediment and nutrient attenuation we've seen in the Wascobs down in southern Illinois. We're looking at a three-county area down there. Got a lot of PIs on the project, Dr. Williard. Uh, Sierra Mertz is a grad student. She'll have a poster set up in the exhibit next door. Amelia Vick, Jenny Snyder, uh, Jackie Gillespie, and uh, Randy Lang are all researchers on this project to help get things done in the field. So a little bit of the background. I think everybody in the room knows what a wasp cob is. Just a sediment berm with a tile in it that allows water to kind of stair step down a drainage way without creating a lot of erosion. So a lot of research has been done on them, but most of it, as the name implies, wascob, water, and sediment. So the hydrology and the sediment component, much less focus has been on the water chemistry. So looking at the nitrogen and phosphorus. And that's what our goal is today, is to look at some of those things. The literature shows the sediment reductions have been 60 to 80 percent. And then total phosphorus reduction is 29 to 85 percent, so a little less efficient in some of the studies for phosphorus. And then the nitrogen ranging from 30 to 76 uh, percent. The NLR, NLRS is going to uh, basically credit these WASCOBs for a 60 percent reduction of phosphorus. So our objectives were to utilize a drone, a UAV, to fly up and assess these wascobs to see how much current sedimentation is coming into them. Uh, we also want to look at water chemistry, obviously, so we're going to sample water during uh, storm events. And then we're going to de uh, uh, do these uh, detailed uh, soil assessments to see how much legacy phosphorus, how much nitrogen is being held in these wascobs over time. So, And we're going to try to relate this all to Wascob age and some other land use or uh, characteristics. So as I mentioned, our study area is down in southern Illinois. Carbondale is right in the left side of that picture. Uh, we've, got, we've got these sites uh, uh, spread across the three county area up to Randolph County, Williamson Ca County, and Jackson County. And our basins, we have 32 of them, and they range in size. Obviously, some of them are really big. Some of them will store about two Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of water. But on average, most of them are storing a few above-ground swimming pools. I don't know if you're familiar with gallons of those pools, but I'm trying to just give you a size. One of them will hold this room, basically. Some of them are much smaller. Uh, the ones outlined in green are the ones that we did the detailed water quality assessment on. So a lot more intensively sampled in those uh, green watersheds. The historic sedimentation, I'm going to talk about historic sedimentation first, then our current sedimentation rates, water quality, and then we're going to look at a little snapshot of one of our watersheds that we just got, or wascobs that we just got established so we know what it looked like at day one and we've been following it for the last six months. So in terms of assessing historic sedimentation, we, I say we, or grad students and researchers, went out and did a grid pattern across these basins and took a bunch of soil cores. And if you look at that soil core on the right, you can see the unconsolidated material on top of that real hard clay pan with all the redoxymorphic features or that modeling look to it. That's where the old original surface was. So that's when they compacted it and built this wascob. So we can assess what the extent of the newly, and when I say newly, I mean within, since the time frame it was built. So most of ours range in seven to eight years old, or our older ones. So we can see how much sediment is accumulated over all this, this grid pattern to see how much volume is there. So this is just a shaded map. Uh, we take those data points, when we take the soil cores, we take the depths, 
we uh, put them into GIS and then create a triangulated irregular network. And using that old soil surface and the new soil surface, or that accumulated material, we can get the total volume calculation of what's in there. Use the bulk density to calculate a mass or load. So the historic sedimentation results, it basically you need to look at those two red numbers. About 3.49, three and, three and a half tons of sediment per acre per year are coming into the Wascobs we surveyed. This is historic sediment. And then about 7.2 pounds per acre per year of phosphorus is stored in these uh, basins. You can see all 32 of them aren't there. 11 or 12 of our Wascobs were brand new. So they were just established, so they have no legacy sediment in them at this point. And the one thing we were trying to tie all this to was uh, Wascob age. But what we found is Wascob age really didn't influence our results at all. Actually, Wascob age, the older the Wascob got, the less sediment that was actually in it. And it doesn't have anything to do with the hydrology or anything like that. It's more of a slope-driven process. So of all the land use variables we looked at, slope was the dominant one in terms of predicting how much sediment would be in that wascob. And this is basin slope, how much the, not the whole watershed, but just within that basin. So the next thing we were looking at is assessing current sedimentation. And you can see in that picture there's a lot of movement. We talked about huge storms at lunch and how much, how they impact these systems. That's one thing we found. A lot of sediment movement occurs in just maybe one or two key storms throughout the year. So when we looked at current sedimentation, we were using feldspar clay pads, and I'll go into that in more detail, and then also this drone imagery. So you can see the drone in the picture on the right flying up there in the air. It's got the little yellow circle around it. The feldspar clay pads are those little white pads on the ground. So when we install these uh, feldspar clay pads, it's just a real white clay that we take a little flour sifter like you use in the kitchen, put it on the ground. So just a nice little veneer in this little square area. So we can come back time after time. If we want to do it after every storm or annually, we can take a soil core and see how deep that clay marker is. It creates a nice white line. And these were installed in the field, basically in the first three or four contour lines in the, of the basin. So this is where most of the action's happening. And then below each one of these feldspar cl clay pads, we put an aluminum disc about 10 inches in the ground. And this aluminum disc was just a, a secondary check because a lot of times the farmer will get in and maybe till or disturb that clay pad and then it's gone. So then you lost your data point. So after figuring this out, we're like, we've got to put something in there at depth that's not going to get tilled up, not going to get disturbed. And I don't know how many metal detectorists we have out here, but when you got a four inch piece of aluminum in the ground that's 3 16 inch thick, you can pick it up pretty quick. So you can, the reason we put the disc there, it's flat and we can take a pin flag and push it down in the soil and measure the depth to surface to that uh, aluminum disc. So it's just gonna accumulate over time, we can see that. So here's our flip, uh, results. You can see in those little images on the left at the, the depth of the feldspar clay, anything on the top of that is accumulated material. Again, we would put this into GIS, create that triangulated irregular network, and we can determine how much sediment, the current volume of sediment in that wascob. The results are very similar to what we saw historically. If you look at on the bottom, the average, we're looking at three tons. We're at three and a half tons of sediment with historic. We're at three tons of sediment with this current sedimentation. Phosphorus went down a little bit. It was up around 7.2, and now it's down to 2.3. And that could be these, some of these major events that we were talking about. So the drone work we looked at, uh, we use a, a drone with ortho mosaic imagery. So it's got a 4K camera on it that's not LIDAR or anything measuring elevation. This 4K camera will fly over the site and has overlapping in images, which are stereoscopic, and create a three-dimensional look. So we can look at it three-dimensionally. And if you look at that tripod over on the right-hand side of the picture, that's an RTK. So that antenna is acquiring satellite signals for like a 30-minute or an hour time frame to get a very pinpoint accuracy of where it's at. Then our drone communicates with that 
so it knows where its X, Y, Z coordinate is of that drone at all times. Here's what a typical flight pattern would look like on the left. Those red dots are where the drone flies. We just plug that in before it takes off. And it goes up and does everything. You just stand there and watch it fly. And like I said, those images overlap by 80%. So there's a lot of overlap and we can get that really good three-dimensional look of that soil. They're all tied in with that upper picture as a control point that just tells us an XYZ coordinate and we can tie those multiple control points together so we know our images are overlapping. So the results, what we're going to create is a basically a digital surface model. So it's going to have highs and lows. You can see on the image on the right, the white areas are the higher and elevation areas. And then we have lower in the dark. And using the, basically the, take the berm height of the WASCOB, shoot it straight across, we, cross, we use that as a plane, a reference plane, and then we measure down from that. So what's the surface originally? And then measure the surface again a year later or after a major storm. The difference between those is how much material accumulated over that given time. So you can see in this next event on the right, this is our two overlapping DSMs. And we had 28 tons of sediment come in over that period of time. And that was one year flight. So we put a lot of faith in the drone. It has RTK. It has really accurate uh, XYZ coordinates. It knows where it's at. But then we wanted to ground truth it. We know our feldspar clay pads aren't moving. So they don't move at all. So the day we put those down, we flew the drone. We know where they're at, and then over time we could compare how much accumulated on top of that pad compared to what our drone predicted accumulated on that pad. So this was our way of ground checking or ground truthing that drone, it, its vertical accuracy. And you can see in the upper ones, I can't see because my eyes aren't that good anymore, but the 3.9 and 7 were about 3 centimeters apart in terms of vertical resolution on that. And if you go down through there, there's some that are higher, some that are lower, and overall our accuracy after looking at all these ground truthing points was about three centimeters. So if we're having more accumulation than three centimeters, the drone works pretty well. If we're right in that three centimeters or we're looking at an annual increase of a centimeter or two, drone's probably not the best way to go, at least one with ortho imagery. LIDAR may be a different story, probably not. Uh, so some of the limitations of this DSM. Obviously, is it has that three, three centimeter error in it. Some of the other things that are going to limit the accuracy of it is going to be your tillage. If somebody came in, a farmer came in and tilled the field that fluffs it up a little bit, you're going to have more vertical uh, discontinuity. I'm not even going to try to say it. Uh, and then we got uh, corn stubble, wheat stubble, soybean stubble, whatever. Any kind of organic matter on the soil surface is going to affect that uh, vertical Z coordinate in terms of that drone. So the next thing we looked at was water chemistry, water quality in these wascobs. If you look at the image on the left, we sampled water as it came into the, the, to the wascob using the, if you know me, we use these stack pole samplers. You've probably seen this image a hundred times, but they're just PVC bottles with a ping pong ball in them. I got one cut in half for you. So that ball will float up and plug the hole. Got a beveled edge on top of the PVC cap and it will plug that hole and give you a snapshot in time of what the water was doing at that level. So we have these set at four inches, eight inches, 12 inches, 18 inches. So as water fills up, your ping pong balls float up to the top and we get snapshots in time. That's for the inlet, incoming water. The outlet water is measured with this other device on the right, and that's down in the tile. So we'll have a, a suction tube down in the tile. This is an automated water sampler. That upper picture, just with the little capsule on it, has a float in it. When that float comes up, it actuates or triggers the uh, sampler to sample. So we start sucking samples from that point forward. This is what our complete setup looks like out in the field. You got that bucket up on top. That's where your bucket sampler is. You've got uh, stack pole samplers. We've got a shaft gauge out there with a, 
a trail camera taking pictures every hour so we know what the stage is in these. And we also have some pressure transducers in there to measure stage more accurately. So our nutrient and sediment loads transported to the basins. We have about 2.3 uh, pounds per acre of total phosphorus coming in. Uh, in terms of tons of sediment, about 2,700 pounds of sediment, so a little over a ton, ton and a half of sediment. And then nitrate, 0.2 pounds per acre. So the big question always is, is how effective are they? What, what, what percentage do we assign to these in terms of reduction? So for total P, if you look at a soil, then the literature looks at this two different ways. So soil, so what is accumulated in the basin to water coming out of the basin. So that's the soil to water column. The water to water column is the water coming in, so our stacked poles, compared to the water going out. You can see the soil to water percentages are higher. About half of the literature reports it that way. The other half will report it the other way, water to water. You can see the one thing that stays consistent is nitrate. Nitrate is pretty mobile in water, so it really doesn't change. The other two that settle out tend to change more with the sediment. So this is the Hayton site, what we call the Hayton site. This site used to have a, a four-foot ditch running through the middle of it. And in July, no, in the end of May, there were wascobs put in this site. So we have two wascobs in this site, and we've monitored it ever since. Uh, we've done everything that we do in our other sites with the instrumentation. We have stack poles out there. We fly it with a drone. We have feldspar clay, the whole nine yards. So this is just an image of what one of the storms looks like at that site, not an image, a video. Hopefully it plays. So this is over about 10-hour time frame. You can see these basins will fill up, and this is just from the trail camera that we have taking time-lapse photos out there. This thing will fill up, it rains again, it drains, it comes back up and responds very quickly with that rainfall event. So here's what the site looked like in June of 2023. This is when we put everything out. Uh, in July, in July 19th of 2023, we had a five-inch rain event. So these things are designed for a 10-year rain event, which in our area is five inches. So we had a 10-year rain event one month into construction. We basically had a little peach fuzz of soybeans out on the ground. We had nothing really protecting the site. So you can see in the second image that there's a big plume of sediment that got pushed in. You can see it on the image. You can see it from the drone. You can see it from the feldspar clay pads, everything shows that uh, plume there. And then following that, we had a couple, just two. We pretty much had a drought later in the year, but we had two rain events that were about two inches. So they were, didn't really fill them up, didn't fill the wascobs up that much, but you can see they started cutting through that big plume that was put down. So it can pick some of that up and take it straight to the outlet. So here's our uh, drone image from that site. I think this is a pretty cool image because it shows you the accuracy of it. You can see the actual uh, tire tracks in the field. You can see the, the red areas where it's accumulated higher, the ditch in the blue, and you can take this and overlap one image from the other and see what the difference is or that change in the Z coordinate. Uh, so the initial sediment movement in this site, we had about 16,000 pounds move in one event. So that's a lot of sediment. And the other wascob had 24,000 pounds. So about 12 tons of sediment came in with one rain event. So I think this is a lot of this is why age wasn't a big factor. Because we had wascobs that were established eight years ago. If they, didn't uh, if they weren't impacted by a 10-year event or a 25-year event like this one was, until the same day this one was, then maybe they didn't have a big movement like this. So, a lot of that sediment, I think, is tied to, not necessarily tied to age, but the intensity of the events, the size of the events, and then just what the land cover practices are at the time. Like I said, we just had a little bit of soybean out on the field. There wasn't much to protect that bare soil that just got moved. So just a summary of the hist historic and current sedimentation. Most of it's occur occurring in a few critical events. 
Most tightly uh, correlated with slope. I've got the grad student looking at other things like rainfall intensity, rainfall volumes, but there was a lot of data to go through um, before this presentation. So cropping practices is another big one. Uh, are we gonna have much runoff, much infiltration? Are we gonna have a surface roughness out there to slow the water down? Is the soil surface protected from rainfall impact? All that stuff goes into it. The overall performance, looking at the soil to water, falls right in there with the literature. Phosphorus and sediment, way up there, 85, 94%. And then nitrate was much lower at 38%. Uh, the drone imagery, it's really good uh, for big events or maybe a five-year time frame or three-year time frame. Not so much on an annual, looking at annual uh, movement. Because if you just have that three centimeter uh, movement and then you've got three centimeters of air, your whole estimate could be air. So upcoming research we're doing with Wascobs, pretty excited about this project. It's going in today, right now. We should be there digging holes and putting pipe in the ground, but we've got other researchers back there doing that. Uh, we've got this uh, site located right to, next to SIU Farms, so it's a two-mile drive. We're going to be able to sample this very intensively, uh, with, equip it with everything we've got. We're going to try some new methods out there. Like I said, within two miles of SIU Farms, so this is on SIU Farms, not within the farm, within the campus. Two miles from campus on SIU Farms. So what we're going to look at out there we got 10 watershed or wascobs that we're putting in. Five of them we're going to monitor uh, for water quality with these different treatments. We've got a control, which is just going to be the NRCS standard. We've got a long detention time, 24 hours. So we're going to put a restrictor plate in that uh, wascob drain pipe in the Hicken bottom where we can cut a smaller hole and, and manage this thing for a 24 hour drain time. Another one, we're gonna have a very short retention time, so we're looking at probably six hours, maybe no restrictor plate. Uh, we've got a biochar treatment, so we're gonna incorporate biochar into one of those uh, wascobs, till it in so it can uh, potentially take up uh, some nitrate, ammonium, phosphorus, bind that material and keep it on site. Uh, and a wood chip plot, just to kind of ramp up uh, denitrification potential. Make sure there's a carbon source there for the microbes. And then we also have two blind inlets we're going to look at, a control one and a biochar one. Like I said, construction's underway. You can see February 7th we were putting these things in. We've been putting them in all week. I'd say they would be done tomorrow, but anybody that owns a tractor within a thousand mile radius of here is going to be at the farm machinery show next week and or this weekend. So He's pulling out tomorrow to go to that. I think it's a family vacation every time they go to Louisville or something. But so hopefully next week, if we don't get any rain, we're going to get these things hemmed up and, and start sampling. them. So here, most of them are in series. There's a picture of one of those plate restrictors or the orifice restrictor. We can cut it to a different diameter to allow more water to flow through and kind of regulate that timing. This is just a quick video showing what's going on out there right now. And like I said, this is occurring today. And uh, they were, they're going to be real close to finishing up today, hopefully one or two more days. And then we have to put in the blind inlets. That'll be a whole other operation. Some of the new things we're going to sample with, when we put these in ourselves, we had the ability to put in a control structure. So instead of sending our uh, automated water sampler down the tile. We can put it in a control box. It's a little more stable system. We can get a more accurate discharge reading to see how much water is moving through these systems. We can look at retention times, all that stuff. The other thing is the vertical stratification. When we were looking at our, our stacked pole bottles, I didn't break it apart by bottle height. But one thing we, we notice sometimes when we're comparing that upper bottle to the outlet, we come up with a negative number. And I think these things are behaving like a toilet almost, where they're pulling stuff, it's sucking it off the bottom. Some of this material, there's more sediment at the bottom than what's up at the top. So we're gonna sample some vertical, you know, snapshots in time at the same point of time 
to see if there's any difference between the bottom of the wash cob and the top of the wash cob and the middle of the wash cob. So I'd like to acknowledge all these folks, obviously Illinois Nutrient Research and Education Council for funding this project. Uh, McIntyre Stennis is helping put the tile in. You know, that's a pretty ch good chunk of change in terms of getting all that plastic in the ground. Uh, the excavating company, uh, Agrodane and Springfield Plastics helped out with some of the tile and control structures. And then we had a bunch of pli uh, private landowners that we're working with. And then a couple of the NRCS folks. Yeah, and we found a floating head in one of the Wascobs too. That's how dedicated my grad students are. She was out there swimming to get her samples. We call this site Long Walk. And you, you walk a long ways to get back there. And if, if you're going to be there, you're going to get the sample. You're not going to walk twice to go back and get waders. So she's out there sampling in all kinds of conditions. So any questions? So do I assume a future project will be various crop rotations and tillage applications, and that'll probably be another NREC project? That sounds like a good one to me. Okay. You showed a 38% reduction in nitrate. What is that? 30, how many pounds of N is that a reduction of? Do you know? Ugh, I don't remember the p total pounds coming in. That's why we got the grad student next door with the data on her poster. Okay, and then now, so where's that water go? I'm not familiar for, with water. So water the water. wascobs that'll come down and then drains through the pipe to a receiving stream, so that's eventually gonna get to the stream. Okay, so you're holding it for a 24 hour period. Right. Slowly releasing it down the water. Right. And some, some of it, the nitrate's more, like I said, mobile in water in the water column. So it's not really settling with the sediment. So it's more mobile and going through the system. And I think that's why they're less effective at treating nitrate. But that's why we're going to, in this new research, we're going to add biochar and wood chips to kind of, and a longer retention time. Because if you can hold that water there longer, you can increase the potential for denitrification or even plant uptake if there's plants growing around it. You can almost put a bioreactor into that pipe because you're slowing it down enough that it might work. The other thing, my other question is, are you looking at, so broadcast fertilizer is going to be a problem up there. So are you looking at a low disturbance equipment to place fertilizer under the soil instead of broadcasting? No, uh, we're, it's on SIU farms and however they're managing this field, that's what we're going to look at. But all the wascobs are in the same field, so they're going to undergo the same management at this time. But like Don mentioned, anything like that, we could look at in the future. Hi. Um, Hi. So in the treatments where you are adding wood chips and biochar to hopefully um, uh, encourage some denitrification, are, are you, um, so obviously you're measuring the outcomes in terms of water quality, but are you uh, um, measuring actual denitrification rates or anything too to see? We have a student on campus that's very interested in doing that component of it, so they are going to look into that. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Dr. Skinner.